I meant to do one of these last week and uh, just totally forgot. Got caught up in real life. So, hey, I'm back. Doing another stupid, pointless vlog about my life uh, on a Sunday night that I'm going to cut together randomly to post on Monday. Because if there's one thing my college years taught me, it's that I do my best work at the last uh, the last minute. I really do. Uh, slowly getting the setup a little bit better. Um, haven't moved all my furniture yet in because Ohio is, I mean, like a lot of the country, getting bitch slapped with winter weather. Uh, it's been cold. It's been snowy. Uh, and then just a lot of stuff going on with the family right now. Uh, we just had my sister and my uncle's birthday the other day, which is cool. My baby sister's 21 now. Where does the fucking time go, man? Jesus Christ. You may have seen what I, the picture I posted on social media. I'll probably cut it in here a little bit, but it's just like, man, how young I was, so so lively and full of hope. It was literally like like the summer after my freshman year of college. Uh, and I got to come see my baby sister graduate from preschool, graduate in quotes. And uh, now she's 21 and figuring out what she wants to do with her life. And yeah. And I got a kid brother who's 23 and man, just, yeah, it's, it's weird to think that man, 20, she's 21 <laughs> and I'm 35. It's, it's just, man, it's, it's fucking surreal. Like I already feel old on my birthday and then, you know, it's like a week and a half later, my sister has hers and just double reminds me how fucking old I am. So it is what it is. I don't, I don't really have a plan for what I want to talk about on this one other than just, um, well, I guess that's not true. I guess there is something that's kind of weighing on my mind, which is, uh, I, I, I've ne- I've always been both like irritated and fascinated by the capacity for some people to just shit on other people's parade. Um, I, I don't know what it is. I've never understood, and I say that as a guy who has, like most people, dabbled in being an asshole. I've dabbled in being a toxic human being, like we all have at some point especially when you literally are growing up like, you know, I remember a time before Facebook even existed. I mean, I remember a time when, when I was my senior year in high school, people were talking about Facebook and I was like, I have no idea what the fuck that is. I was still getting used to what MySpace was. And it's also because I grew up in a household where like that kind of thing was not allowed. I had a MySpace page. My parents found out about it. I lost computer access for like the rest of the fucking year. Um, I got my, my parents didn't let me go to my senior prom because I had a Facebook page or a, a MySpace page. My parents were not pro social media because at the time social media wasn't a word that wasn't even a term people used. It was just, you know, my parents were very much of that generation of parent that, um, you know, learned about the scary shit happening on the internet from stuff like law and order svu so my parents were just convinced there was a pedophile around every corner of the internet waiting to just reach through the screen and grab a hold of my dick i guess i don't know uh which is not far from the truth but it just i mean i remember being in college and having parental controls on the family computer it's a whole other story but that's not what i'm here to talk about but it's just yeah like i'm part of that generation that had to figure out what social media actually was we were the guinea pigs for it because it wasn't a thing and even myspace you know was literally like myspace was just there to show off who you were it wasn't like the basically like you know i remember a time when facebook was literally just myspace light there you know your statuses weren't you weren't posting things on facebook you were just changing your status to like at lunch at work i remember back when it was just a drop down and you just selected one and you could share pictures, but you couldn't share text posts. You could create notes, which were basically a blog. Um, but you couldn't post links to stuff. None of that. None of that was a thing when I was. That didn't become a thing until I think my like the the end of my freshman year of college. It's crazy how much it evolved in the course of like the span of a year. Cause that was also the same year that I remember one of my professors talking about how Apple was getting ready to release the first iPhone. And I was like, there's no fucking way that's actually a thing. That is far too that technology doesn't exist yet. And then like by that summer, I had a summer job working at a coffee shop and and 
people, you know, rich motherfuckers. It was all rich motherfuckers because they were so expensive and they were only available on AT and T. Um, if you had an iPhone, you had fucking money. And I mean, I guess you could probably say the same, but like, it was the first smartphone. Those 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 weren't a thing. Uh, and then the Droid came out, and then the rest is history. But as being part of the generation that basically was the guinea pig for social media. I think it's very clear that of the, a lot of people who, because there's the generation now that have had it their whole lives, um, who just they are going into social media. Are the, the 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 societal rules have been established? My generation had to shape those rules by fucking up a lot, and I am very much not without. Uh, I very much have blood on my hands. In that case, uh, trust me, as a, as a, I was 18, 19 years old when this concept of internet, uh, I hate to call it anonymity because your name's fucking attached to it, but just the idea of the internet becoming an echo chamber, like I was very much at that right age because everyone's a dick in their early adult years. Everyone's a piece of shit to some degree. Um, and, you know, we talk about how the Internet created a place for the shittiest people to have a voice. And I was very much a part of that. I had to grow. Uh, I've gr- like when I look back, I'm, I've gotten to the point now, like I don't like when I go through like my Facebook memories. I only go back a certain number of years because I see some of the shit that I was saying as an 18, 19, 20 year old. That is embarrassing to say the least. But it, it's because I was a hormonal late teen uh, who didn't under, who, who was I was I was a new to comedy. And like most new comics, I was I made the mistake of the edgier, the better. Whatever, man, I'm just joking. I was, it was meant to be funny. You know, I was one of those guys. I was a fucking teenage edgelord like most teenage guys my age uh, were, especially the ones who got into comedy. So. And it's because I was at that age where I was just saying the first thing that came to my mind and not thinking about the power words can have. And this isn't, and I don't want everyone to jump on the whole like blah 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 freedom of speech. If anyone who knows me, know me longer than ten seconds, knows I'm very much a proponent of free speech. Say what you want, but just be prepared. Hi Archie, just be prepared for the fact that like someone's going to read and see and hear those words, and they're going to come back at you. I I had to learn that lesson many times over, whether it was bitching about my job online not taking into account that people i worked for and with could see what i was posting online i i i really had to 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 learn that lesson and a lot of people didn't i think and it shows um for those who don't know, uh, here in the area and in, in Dayton, Ohio, we have a local comedy club called Brickies. Um, it's it's very new. It's very independent. It's literally a, a comic who's been in town, who's been around the scene for a long time, has always wanted to open his own comedy club. And he was like on the verge of making it happen right before COVID started. And so like plans got set back. And so he finally year or two ago, a little over a year ago, coming up on two years, um, reached out to a local brewery where he's at that had this huge event event room that they just weren't using. And uh, so on Fridays, Saturday, on Fridays, Saturdays, they, he basically gets to rent it as a, as a comedy venue. And uh, it, it's been really great. It's been a great, like, like street level comedy venue where local guys who are like on my level get to have the experience of doing bigger shows at a venue that has, I don't want to say less to lose, but like we have one of the clubs in town is Wiley's Comedy Club, which is like the mecca for comedy here in in Dayton because like it's the oldest club in Ohio. It was the first club here in Dayton. Um, There's a lot of history on that stage. And that's a club that's got an established history it's been there for decades um, going on. It's we just had, I think, 40 years, I think, was the anniversary we just celebrated. I could be wrong on that. Don't check me. Um, but 
they're gonna they're not gonna take as big as swings because they've got like a, they've got like employees and they've got a lot of things riding on their business with with brickies it's not that there's nothing riding on it but it's a much smaller more independent operation that's going on so having brickies has been really great and in february in just a few weeks the week of valentine's day uh they're going for the world record longest continuous comedy festival uh the current record is 80 hours we're going for 81 continuous hours of comedy this is going to be a massive undertaking and i'm not doing this just to promote the show that i am booked on a couple different times (laughs) um but uh for those who aren't comedians you know there's a lot of facebook groups dedicated to local scenes and comedy and things like that and there's one group that's always been kind of towed the line between being funny and just toxic and it's a comedy group called bad comedy flyers and the idea is for comics to take flyers for comedy shows that are just in desperate need of of a rework there's a lot of little intricacies that go into making a quality flyer for a comedy show that just people who aren't used to it might not understand and so a lot of time it's it, it's it's basically a way for comics to lightly roast each other for their shitty show flyers it's it's what it is it's it's a it's a group made up of comedians and the idea is to roast shows comedically like you do at a roast over a shitty flyer um or offer insight to ones that are just truly abysmal like little things like hey put the address or the name of the lo- or the name of the fucking venue you know, put the time that it starts, put the ticket price, you know, like, like little things. Don't overcrowd it, things like that. Uh, well, somebody decided to put the flyer for the Brickies Comedy Club World Record Festival up in the group. And I'll put it here. This is what it looks like, um, which led to people commenting. Well, what's what what what's shitty about it? This is a, it's a pretty good flyer, actually, to which the OP replied. There's nothing wrong with the flyer. This is just a shitty idea. Which led to an absolute fucking like like bleeding knuckle war of words in the comments. Which to me is so far beyond a the point of the group. The group is you roast people for shitty flyers and offer and offer tips. Not roast an entire comedy scene for trying to do something different. And as more and more of us from the scene saw this post happen, we were like, what the fuck? What is, what is the, who's, who, what, are, what is the problem? The more we started to defend it, the more some of these people seemed to just come after us. I mean, what a shitty fucking idea it is. And you're all fucked. It's like, oh, of course you're defending it. You're on the fucking show. Well, no shit, but I'm not defending it just because I'm on the show. I'm defending it because as a member of this comedy scene, yeah, it's a crazy fucking undertaking. It's an like like the the moving parts for this are I, I do not feel any I, I feel I, I do not envy uh, Kevin Kevin Rupert who who runs Brickies at all for the headache this has got to be. And I and I, w- I won't get into all the details, but I know some of what's been going on behind the scenes is trying to make this happen. It's been an absolute absolute headache, you know. But you know our scene is still gonna it's like it's it's still worth trying if your scene has it in you has it in itself to do something really cool even just to try who because honestly honestly who gives a fuck if it works or not just the fact that we had the balls that we're having the balls to try something i, I think speaks volumes and it it brings me to bring it back to kind of what I was starting to talk about with the whole like toxic thoughts and all that thing. I can understand from an outsider's perspective on paper, the idea of a local comedy scene attempting a world record like this is insane. This is, this, this is the actions of people who are not right in the head. I would suggest that anybody who is even attempting to do comedy is already not right in the head. I've said as much on stage. This is not doing stand up is not the behavior of somebody who has a who has a strong emotional foundation. We're not doing this because we have a great grasp on on our lives. We're doing this because we're all a fucking mess. Um, but it just it got me to that to that mentality of like 
why do some people find it fun pissing in somebody else's Cheerios, raining on somebody else's parade? And it got me to this idea because you hear a lot of these comments go around about other scenes and other comedians in any comedy scene. Every comedian is going to talk shit at some point. But more often than not, you're going to have at least one comedian in a scene who's a little gatekeepy, who talks a lot of trash, who sees other people's successes or even attempts at success at some kind of threat towards their own. And I will say, I can understand where that thought process starts. Because I, and this is a me thing, I do typically believe that humans are instinctively self-serving. That being said, I think more human beings than we give them credit for have it in them to work past that. And what I mean is this. Most toxic thoughts are reactionary. They are instinctive. There's something you have as a knee-jerk reaction. You see something, it, it clicks a certain part of your brain, and it makes you go, well, now hang on a fucking second. What the fuck is this? The difference, though, is not everyone takes five seconds to think about it. And I really and truly think that's all it takes. There's nothing inherently wrong, I think, with having an initial toxic, jealous, envious thought. To me, what's more important is are you willing to think about it for just five seconds before you say or do anything? And a lot of people, not most, but a lot of people are not willing to take the five seconds. And if you want any more like, like clear example of that, look in the comment section of any female comics clip on TikTok or YouTube or Reels or whatever, or any post about any kind of music for that, honestly, on Facebook and like country music, hip hop. I mean, it's just as a metalhead, trust me, we are full of people like that. And I think a lot of that's because nowadays we're so, because we're all plugged into everything, we're all on social media. I think it's really easy for people to get the idea of like having a quick thought typing it out before I lose it and posting it and not taking the five seconds to think well now wait a goddamn minute hang on let me think about this it's really easy I think for someone to see a female comic who's also attractive getting attention and immediately thinking oh well they're getting attention because they're attractive because that is kind of the nature of media in general you know the concept of sex sells like it, it i mean it I'm, we're, we're, look i'm not so naive i'm not gonna act like it doesn't i'm not gonna act like there aren't people out there in the world who have skated by because of physical appearances cough cough matt rife but at the same time while that thought process is i think naturally occurring understandably so What's less understandable is someone not taking the five seconds to think, well, now hang on a sec. That can't be it. They can't only be successful because of their looks. You know, they can't like their like their looks, especially in 2024, that's just not gonna get you very far anymore because everyone's on video. Everyone's on video. Every comic is posting clips. So when you see you know, shitty people leaving these toxic, oh, ha ha, that's not actually funny, mostly on female comics clips. It's like, well, you say that, but in the clip, there's a room full of people laughing. So clearly somebody finds this fucking funny. You know, there are so many comedians here in just this local scene that I love with my whole heart that I think are some of the greatest, nicest, most wonderful people on the face of the earth that I do not find particularly funny. Doesn't mean I think any less of them. 
But that's that's the beauty of humor, though, is that no two people have the same sense of humor. You know, I could not tell Nolan Krieger's jokes and get a laugh, nor could Nolan Krieger tell my jokes and get a laugh because different experiences, different people. You know, not every comic in town is going to get booked on the same shows together because it's about finding, you know, comedians that have that good vibe with each other. There are some truly talented comics, great writers that I just don't find funny. And it's nothing to do with them. It's not like I'm saying, oh, they're not funny. No, it just doesn't. It. My favorite analogy is to say that it's not my flavor of ice cream. You know, I, I, t- I talk about that with music. I talk about that with film and TV. And I talk about that with comedy. Because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not good. Now, are there cases out there of things where it's like, no, that's just objectively not funny? Debatable. Um, because to say something is is absolutely not funny, it's like there's got to be at least one person out there who thinks that's funny. Usually it's the person saying it on stage, but it is what it is. But my point to kind of again, get this all focused is that when I see someone posting really shitty comments or doing something really shitty based off of initial thought, I'm finding myself less and less angry at these people and more and more just confused. Like you couldn't give this more than a second's thought. Really? You know, those are the people I always encourage to, hey, man, rather than coming on here and bitching or coming on here and just talking shit, just stop and think about it for a sec. Type it out. Type out whatever it is you want to type. But think before you post it, not because not to stop you from having your thoughts, but ask yourself, does this actually make sense, though, to say that someone like you know, people will say like like Elijah Schlesinger or Michelle Traina or Betsy Cox or any of them are. It's like, oh, this isn't. A, yeah, no, this isn't. A, you're not funny. You know, you're. This, this isn't funny. It's so funny. I forgot to laugh. It, you see, you see that on every. Go to any female comics reels, and you'll see. You will not have to scroll far to see those comments. And it's that initial reaction of like, oh, here they go. This fucking again. Here's this is bullshit again. This isn't fucking funny, but if you are you actually listening to the fucking clip, though, not the joke, just the sound of people laughing. Clearly, someone thinks it's funny. So when you see that another comedy scene is attempting to do something. Yeah, outlandish. We're going for a world record. Yeah, that's outlandish as fuck. Your first reaction is, well, that's fucking stupid. Well, that's a terrible idea. Yeah. It probably is, but at least we're trying. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a huge undertaking. We're going to fucking try, though, and if we don't, at least we tried. That's comedy 101. That's that's why open mics exist. There's not a comic alive that's ever gotten a joke right, done it right on the first time. They've worked that joke a million times. That's all we're doing is on a bigger scale. It's very easy. It's very easy, especially if you're somebody who has struggled or is struggling when you see somebody in your same field doing, for lack of a better word, better than you, just having more success than you, at least at that given time. It's really easy to think, to look for ways for their successes and your lack of success, it's 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 really easy to look to, to try and find some, you know, some conjecture or maybe conjecture, not story, but to find a way to explain it away, to be like, oh, well, they're getting that success and I am not because blank. It's like, no, they just are in this industry and in entertainment. Getting success a lot of times is 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 who, you know, and right place, right time. Ariel Elias is a great example of that. She she was just doing a show at a club and some asshole threw a beer at her on a stage because that's the world we live in now. And the clip went viral as it fucking should have because that is wild. Is she the first comedian to have something like that happen to her? No. Trust me, every comic's got a horror story about a heckler. 
she got the video she got the great she had a great she had a great video great angle like first of all it was a well shot video it was perfect angle you could see everything that happened you can hear everything that's happening it's great audio quality so that's number one was it was a well put together it was just a well a well edited clip the timing of it was spectacular her reaction to it to drinking the beer was spectacular and Jimmy Kimmel is a guy who, you know, he he saw that and was like, I'm getting her on the fucking show because that is absolutely insane. But also remember, Jimmy Kimmel is a guy who has really gotten back into supporting stand up comedy, you know, where he comes from. You know, he opened up the Jimmy Kimmel Comedy Club, um, which is a big, a big headliner club out there in L.A. And he's been big on like getting back to doing to having stand up, you know, as Stan has been having this resurgence again in the, in the 2020s. Um, and in the late 20 teens so yeah because the minute that happened suddenly every comic was posting their clips of horror story heckler videos and yeah it's all been a thing but that's not gonna that's not what's gonna get you booked she was already on a rise at that point it wasn't like she was an open micer who suddenly is getting booked to headline clubs like She's still getting booked to headline clubs because after that video went viral and after she went on Jimmy Kimmel and after she started getting booked on these headline shows, she went and did the fucking headline shows and delivered. She went and did the work. She was already doing the work, had been doing the work for a while. And then after she had the viral, the virality happen. She put in the fucking work afterwards. She didn't just stop because if she wasn't good at what she's doing, she wouldn't still be getting fucking booked. That is in comedy that trust me. I know people like to think that that someone's success in comedy is based on their physical appearance, especially when it comes to female comics. At at the end of the day, you got to be fucking funny because there is no other way to get booked in this industry. Yes, you can get a bigger social media following and a higher post engagement if you're a more physically attractive, you know, in terms of like, you know, standard issue uh, attractiveness. Yeah, yeah, you t- it can totally help boost your social media numbers. Th- the comedy club's not going to book you because you got 5,000 Instagram followers. They're not going to book you because you got 10,000 Instagram followers. They're going to book you because... You, when you send them your fucking material, a reel, they're like, oh, yeah, no, you're fucking funny and you draw an audience and you can sell tickets. Yeah, we're going to fucking book you. They're not booking Ariel Elias because they think she's fucking hot. Okay, that's not how it works. All of this, again, to circle back to. I can understand why it's easy to look at that from a surface level and think, okay, attractive person's getting booked. I'm not getting booked. It's because they're attractive and I'm not. Or because you're the kind of person that says that shit out loud. Maybe it's because you're just an asshole, you know? Like, so that's kind of the thought process that's been weighing on my mind a lot lately is this idea of like, yeah, everyone has toxic thoughts. It's everyone has moments of jealousy and envy and wanting to mitigate the situation by trying to ex- trying to take the blame. Like, like, take the blame off ourselves like this thing is happening and it's not happening for me and it's not my fault or this other thing is happening and I don't like it and therefore no one else should I don't understand why somebody else likes that look I have never in my life understood why people like Nirvana I don't like Nirvana I'm, and I know a lot of people have already un, are going to unsub when they see me say that I don't like Nirvana I'm not going to talk shit if you do though there's a lot of music I listen to that gets shit talked all the fucking time that is fine i can live with that because at the end of the day i'm still gonna listen to it you don't have to so when someone's when i see these toxic thoughts these toxic comments and things get circulated i i have found in the last year or so my my mentality has no longer been to really react or give it much thought for me, I, I I find my instead my my thought process goes to why do you care? You know, think about it for five seconds. Really think about it. Put some thought into it and think, is this actually true or am I just, you know, 
upset, jealous, envious. Again, it's it's easy to have those thoughts. There's a lot of things. It's it's easy to be angry. It's easy to hate shit. It's easy to not like stuff. It takes effort to appreciate a different point of view. It takes effort to consider another another position. And that's something that I think that as just in general as a society we've gotten away from. Uh, and it's not it's not it's not like from a political standpoint, just in general. We we've, we've gotten to a point where we've become so comfortable with just the things we like and we can't understand why anyone doesn't why anyone likes differently and rather than just let them be we feel the need to engage or to or, or to 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 put, plant a flag in the ground and that's where those i think it's where those those toxic thoughts and those toxic actions come from it's not thinking things through to circle it back to what I brought up earlier about being, uh, being a shitty, toxic 18, 19 year old in college. Trust me, there are things I have said and done in my life that I will regret till the day I die. But I, I make an effort now as an adult who knows better to be better, to show through my words and my actions that yes, I to, to quote Scott Pilgrim, I dabbled in being a bitch. I am doing the best I can to not so much make up for that, but to personify the change I want other people to have. Because life is not life without growth and change. So the next time you have you find yourself feeling some toxic thoughts like that, feeling a sense of jealousy or envy or anger or frustration. Just remember, it's okay to feel those things. It's okay to think those things. But you need to take it one step further. Don't just latch on to the first thought or the first feeling you have. Hold on to it and let it marinate for a little bit and just walk it through some what-ifs. Really give it some thought. You might surprise yourself. You might surprise yourself with how it affects your outlook on life in general, how it affects your appreciation for things in general, how it affects your mood in general. I don't know. I, these, these are just the musings of a, of a painfully sober pro-ham comic who is in the middle of the... Uh, who who is in in not not to not not to steal steal a word from a from from my LGBTQ plus friends, but who is in the middle of a of a hell of a transition from a life standpoint right now? Trust me, uh, it's really easy to to go to a dark, angry place and live there because well, I'm already here. Why would I bother? I'm already here. Why would I bother trying to do anything about it? But. I I found in recent years that if you just if you just go with your go with your gut reaction every time you have a thought, you're gonna find yourself unhappy more often than you're not. And I'm a guy who's trying really hard to find light in a dark place in his life right now. The last thing I need to do is send myself to a dark place because I can't let I can't let it go that someone else is succeeding more than me instead I find a lot more joy and a lot more happiness in being that person's cheerleader because as somebody who has struggled for success in his career as a comedian and otherwise as someone who doesn't get to have cheerleaders very often I know how good it feels to have someone in my corner, not just from an emotional support. Like, like it's one thing to say, yeah, I know my mom's in my corner. I know my best friend's in my corner. It's another thing to have somebody showing they're in your corner. So that's why you see that a lot from your, your musician friends, your comedian friends, your artist friends. I saw I saw a post on Facebook the other day that basically said, you know, I think I think my buddy Vander said it. He said, like, you know, so many people go out here and talk about supporting local businesses, supporting small businesses, 
but can't be bothered to share your your artist friends posts you know when your comedian friend posts a reel you know or your artist friend posts a picture of their art or your musician friend posts some music they're working on it takes zero minutes and costs zero dollars to like and share you know uh i one thing that comedians hate Whenever we invite people to come see us at a show. Anytime someone asks me, where are you at in the show? What time do you go on? How far in the show do you go up? You know what? Just tell me you're not coming. (laughs) Okay. Because that's a question that tells me that like you want to be supportive of me. If it's not going to inconvenience you, you know, you want to be supportive of me from a distance. You want to be supportive of me if it's not going to be too much trouble. And I get that. I understand that we all value our own time and we're taught to value our own time and we should value our own time. But just remember, like, your your artist friends notice when when that support's not there. That's why I like to be people's cheerleader when I can be because not everyone gets to have one and it's a good feeling when you do. That's why I started the Gem City Comedy website was because Dayton's a small market sandwiched between two much bigger markets. You know, we're sandwiched between Columbus and Cincinnati. And so I wanted everyone who's a comedian in Dayton to feel like they're hitting the big time by, hey guys. We're going to plug your shows. We're going to put profiles for you guys on the website to make you feel like a star, to make you feel like someone who's going to hit it big, to give you an easy place to promote your stuff. Because sometimes you just need that person in your corner because in the world, in the digital age we're in now, surrounded by the negativity coming at us from all sides, those toxic thoughts, those toxic reactions from people who don't take five seconds to think. Being that little bit of positivity in someone's life goes a much much longer way than people think. So take the five seconds. Take the five seconds to think. And remember, you don't have to feel ashamed of your thoughts. Your thoughts are normal. It's what you do with those thoughts that makes a difference. It's okay to think to have that reaction of like, well, what the fuck? Why aren't I getting this kind of success? Think about it for five seconds. You might surprise yourself. I've rambled for almost 40 minutes about this. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. Hopefully you stuck around till the end. See you again next time.